Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Owens, and today I'm going to be talking about the anisotropic etch characterization of silicon nitride and polysilicon in the Tryon ICP RIE that we have here on campus at RIT. First, a quick introduction. As devices grow in complexity over the years, the need for high aspect ratio structures becomes more and more apparent. Anisotropic etching is the key to achieving this high aspect ratio. Isolation structures, multiple patterning techniques, nanometer scale FETs, and MEMS devices all depend heavily on anisotropic etching to meet today's performance standards. As we gain more control of our etching profile, we gain control over the overall device performance, as well as opening the doors to much more dense structures leading to smaller devices. This project takes the first steps towards characterizing our anisotropic etch capabilities to allow RIT to move towards this more advanced processing. One way that this will move our devices forward is by allowing us to move from a localized oxidation method of isolation known as LOCOS over to shallow trench isolation. In LOCOS, the field pushes into the active region, leading to a less dense final chip. Shallow trench isolation allows for smaller isolation features while also allowing for an abrupt shift from the field region to the active regions of the devices. Another step forward is the ability to use multiple patterning techniques. This is a technique that can be used to create devices at a pitch that is smaller than what you can directly print on the wafer using lithography. When using a technique such as self-aligned double patterning, as seen here, the etching all needs to be highly anisotropic, and we see that in order to take advantage of processing like this, we need anisotropy in our toolbox. Just a single self-aligned double patterning layer has a minimum of three required anisotropic etch steps. Now, if we take it a step further, this self-aligned double patterning using multiple anisotropic etch steps could then be used to realize structures such as sub 30 nanometer fin fets here at RIT. This would allow us to teach and learn at a higher level, getting students closer and closer to modern FET structures in their studies, as they will have the opportunity to get their hands on the production and testing of these devices. Next, a little bit of theory. There are many different dry etching techniques out there, but for the most part, they all rely on free radicals or just chemically active elements or compounds to volatilize the surface of a target material so that it can then be pumped away by the vacuum system. In the case of inductively coupled plasma, or ICP, the vacuum chamber where the etch is taking place is fitted with a set of coils that wrap around the plasma. These coils are used to induce eddy currents in the body of a plasma, which leads to more free radicals that participate in the etch. It only makes sense that when there are more free radicals in the plasma, which are the key component to a dry etch, the overall etch rate of a given material increases in said plasma. Reactive ion etching, on the other hand, adds a capacitively coupled radio frequency or RF signal, which produces a directional electrical field producing a highly anisotropic etch. The created free radicals are accelerated towards the wafer's surface, giving added direction to the etch. We've made it this far without really giving anisotropy a concrete definition. So what is anisotropy? Anisotropy relates the vertical and horizontal portions of an etch. In an isotropic etch, there is some horizontal and vertical etching causing the final critical dimension or CD of a feature to be smaller than what was printed in the litho step. The opposite of this, as you can probably guess, is a completely anisotropic etch. Anisotropic etching has no horizontal component resulting in a perfectly vertical etch. Degree of anisotropy takes a ratio between these two components to quantify how anisotropic a given etch is. The closer to one this ratio is, 
the better the anisotropy of that etch. Another metric that we can use is the measurement of the angle of the sidewall shown as alpha. This measurement is made between the wall of the etch and the substrate surface. Sidewall angle is often used because it's a bit easier to wrap your head around. As this angle approaches 90 degrees, the feature becomes more anisotropically etched. And as the sidewall angle gets smaller and the feature starts to look more like a trapezoid, the etch is considered more isotropic. Now that we know what anisotropy is, we need to consider what knobs we have available to us to tune the anisotropy of an etch. While the specific gas that is being used to etch a film plays a significant role in determining the rest of these parameters, there are simply too many gases that can etch a given film to pursue all of them. So in this case, I chose to stick with gases that are already plumbed to the tool, and then I can focus on improving the recipe that already exists. From here, the major inputs are pressure of the chamber, the ICP power, and the RIE power. The specific gas flows has some effect on the final etch rate of the recipe, but it turns out that it plays a relatively small role in setting the degree of anisotropy. In order to analyze the data that we get out of the first DOE with a top-down image from an optical microscope, we need to define a few things to extract the sidewall angle. Since there wasn't a neat trick that I knew of to measure the angle, Instead, I opted to measure the resist that was put down, since it acted as the masking layer, and then compare this intended dimension with the actual dimensions of the top width and bottom width of the nitride film after the etch. With these metrics, we can then calculate the undercoat and then use some trigonometry to calculate the sidewall angle alpha using the thickness and this undercut that we calculated. Now that we know the inputs, we need to consider what we will observe to quantify and effectively score the etch. Some of these outputs include the etch rate, or how fast the film is removed, and the selectivity to resist, because if a recipe removes the resist faster or as fast as the film, we could lose our masking layer and end up with eroded features. While considering these etch rates, we'll also look at the sidewall angle and the undercut to key into the anisotropic capabilities of the etch. As we move into the first DOE for the nitride, I started with the base recipe on the tool for wafer 3, and then I varied the RIE power for increased directionality and the pressure that would change the mean free path length for the radicals. And this would capture the initial conditions of the etch to see where we needed to move to try to increase our anisotropy. After the first round, we see that the wafers that share RIE power have similar etch rates, which is wafers 3 and 5 and wafers 4 and 6. Then, using the T-Capture software on the microscope, I measure the top and bottom width of the features as seen as the pink lines and the purple outlines. After measuring, we found that there was a relatively similar undercut in all cases of a few hundred nanometer, which is by no means ideal, but we can still use this data and analyze the results. Using these undercut values, I found the anisotropy of the, all the wafers measured with this technique was not very good. The range started at 48 degrees and worked up to 57 degrees. However, it's important to note that the resolution of the image greatly impacts the final calculated angle. The drawing on the right shows that at this scale, there are instances that the width of a pixel forces the measured value to be longer than it actually is. This added length may seem insignificant, but it can change the sidewall angle by multiple degrees. This will overall exaggerate undercut and make the edge look more isotropic than it actually is. One issue that I ran into with the T-Capture software was that I had to manually click on the edges of the structures that were to be measured. And in doing so, there was a lot of error as individual pixels of misclick lead to large variation in my measured length due to the combination of the resolution of the screen and the magnification used in the image. In order to address this, the measurements were recollected using ImageJ, which is an image processing package. ImageJ has the ability to find the edges of a given feature and highlight them. 
Then, using the new image as seen on the bottom right, the same measurements can be collected right in image J to recalculate the sidewall angle. Eliminating this inherent error in the T-capture boosted our overall sidewall angles to a new range of 53 degrees up to 61 degrees, but they are still very far from perfect. However, it's important to note again that this artificial undercut that we mentioned on the last slide is still in effect, so it's possible that these values are falsely low. Following the results of the first round, I didn't see much spread in the sidewall angles or etch rates, so in order to get some variation in the data, I increased the pressure range that I was looking at. This decision was trying to capture a larger difference in the mean free path length which would then translate to more variation in the etch. Another change that was made was increasing the duration of a clean recipe that is ran to condition the chamber before running. The clean burns an oxygen-based plasma to help passivate the surfaces of the chamber. The standard procedure called for a five minute clean, but some of the other users and technicians recommended increasing this time up to 10 or 15 minutes and trying the etch again. In this case, a 10 minute clean was ran once before all of the wafers were etched for the day. When running the new recipes after the chamber pre-cleans and using the ImageJ software to calculate the sidewall angle, this round had much better results than the first round. With a new range of sidewall angles of 81 degrees up to almost 83 degrees, this round was much closer to an ideal anisotropic etch. It is important to note that this came at the cost of etch rate, as in the first round, the etch rate was as fast as 33 angstroms per second, but the fastest in this round was 25 angstroms per second. Another important note is that while wafer 4 had marginally lower sidewall angle, the selectivity to resist was much better in this recipe. Once we had the optical measurements, the wafers were cleaved and then coated with 15 nanometers of titanium so that a cross-sectional SEM image could be collected for each sample. In many cases, the cleaving process led to a lot of debris on the samples, but the point of the project was still captured. In all cases, the target was one micron line space pairs, but in some, the debris did not allow for a clear image so 1.5 micron lines were used for imaging purposes. In this case, wafer 1 had highly anisotropic sidewalls and there seemed to be little undercut as both the lines and spaces were 1.5 micron, which was the target for this section of the mask. Wafer 2 also ended up with very little undercut as both lines and spaces were also 1.5 micron. However, in this case, we can see that the sidewalls of the etch bow in a little, making more of an hourglass figure. In the case of wafer 3, the 1 to 1 micron lines were imaged, and we can see that the undercut is much more noticeable as the lines and spaces are not equal widths. The sidewall angles from this recipe are much higher in the cross section than the optically calculated angles, validating that the pixels are the limiting factor in the accuracy of the calculations. It is also important to note the significance of feature density, which we can see the effects of on the left of the image where the field meets the active region. Since there are no more features beyond this point, the electric field at this location of the etch is much different, leading to a significantly different final result. Once again, we can see that there are more undercut present in the 1 to 1 micron lines as they are not equal width as the spaces. However, the sidewall angles are still highly anisotropic and comparable to the other etches in the series. Now that we have found a few decent etch recipes, what comes next? Nitride is only one material, and we need to work towards characterizing recipes for other films such as polysilicon and oxide. On top of this, the data for the first round of DOE should be reran, as the clean duration seems to have a significant effect on the performance of the etch. Moving on to polysilicon may be difficult, as it is normally etched with a chlorine and hydrogen bromide blend, 
but we cannot use these chemistries on the tool as it stands today. Polysilicon can be etched using the gases on the tool, but they are not typically used to produce small-scale anisotropic features. Recipes do exist, but are a lot less characterized, meaning that the DOEs required for polysilicon will need to encompass more factors to capture enough information to make an informed step in the right direction. Another issue that will need to be checked is the uniformity of this tool. Anisotropy is great, but a cross wafer uniformity as well as wafer to wafer uniformity need to be addressed before these recipes can be used to reliably make devices even at a low volume. In conclusion, we developed a viable recipe to etch silicon nitride in the Tryon ICP RIE here on campus. The cleaning of the chamber proved to be an essential step to achieving high sidewall angles. Now that there is an established recipe for nitride, we are one step closer to being able to realize more complex devices and structures, and the learnings from the processing and research have made significant headway in setting up the other films for successful recipes on this tool. As I wrap things up, I just wanted to take the time to say thanks to Dr. Pearson and Dr. Jackson for all the support throughout the semester, as well as a huge thanks to my classmates for all the assistance and processing and those of you who came in off hours to do work with me. And, and just to drop a name, thanks so much to Venkatesh for all his help with the SEM imaging and all of his processing knowledge that has been so helpful throughout the term. Thanks to everyone.